my brothers and sisters, glory be to God, Jesus Christ is alive, and welcome to the Gospel Hour with David. Today, we have a great question from one of our brothers, uh, Brother Michael Harris. Hello, brother from England. Isn't that amazing? Huh, I'm sitting here in Colorado, USA, and I have a friend in England. How you doing, my friend? And not only do I have a friend in England, I have friends all over the world, and although we're not, like, besties, best friends, maybe one day we will be. Who knows, you know, that's the thing with the power of God's Spirit. Nothing can separate us, and nothing is impossible for God. A lot of times in our lives, we're trying to kind of remove God from our existence, or presence, or the need for God. So I have a few things today. The question is, right, he wants to know, my brother Michael would like to know, a little bit more about Paul's conversion uh, on, on the way to Damascus, and how Jesus appeared to him, and Jesus said to Paul, right, Stop persecuting me. And, and Paul says, well, who are you, Lord? And Jesus says to Paul, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. And the one you are persecuting. Right? And, and, and that stopped Paul from persecuting Christians. Now, Paul grows up in, in uh, Tarsus, Right? That, that's in, in, in uh, Turkey, modern-day Turkey, just outside of uh, Constantinople or, or Istanbul, right? He's, he's way up in Turkey. Now, now it took it. That's the thing. When we read the Bible, we think just like, pow, everything began to happen. And God just was moving everywhere and everything just miracle after miracle. But you got to realize and understand, Paul is in Turkey. Everything that happened with Jesus happened in Jerusalem. Now, it took some time, it, it took a few years for, for the message to come all the way from Jerusalem into Turkey. And, and there Paul is a devout uh, priest, he, he's a, a Pharisee, he's the son of a Pharisee, and surely he's from a long line of Pharisees and a long line of people who love Judaism, and not just Judaism, but the Old Testament. They're, they're, they're completely devoted to the Old Testament. And, and today we have, Cato is here. Hello, Cato. And she says, I wish I see you live so I can ask you a question directly. Well, you, you, you're, all your questions are going to be asked. And I bet you if you did ask a question, somehow God's going to show and prove to us that we are connected. Even though, you, you you know, it's tough, it's not exactly a live stream, but it's good. Now, so it takes a few years, Paul hears, and they come in, and they're preaching Jesus Christ. That, you know, and Paul's hearing that message about them preaching about Jesus. Now, there's a couple of discrepancies in the, in, in the book of Acts, it says, Paul was there in Jerusalem, and he was uh, eyewitness to the stoning of Stephen, and even held his coats, and at that time his name was Saul. But Paul himself, in all of his writings and everything, even in Galatians, when he's telling his story about his conversion, he, he never mentions himself that he was Saul. He, he only mentions that he, he's Paul, Apostle of Jesus Christ. But in the book of Acts, it says there's this man from Tarsus. Paul is from Turkey, and, and he was there giving approval to the stoning of Stephen. Stephen was the first Gentile to be converted, not into Judaism, but converted in, into believing that the Bible, the, the, the Tanakh, the Old Testament, was 100% believable. Believable. And what made it believable was Jesus Christ. And now they come, and the word hits Paul, and he hears it, and he's all upset. And he's like, you know, 
God. The only God there is is the God in the Bible, right? And they got Old Testament. They don't have New Testament. And as far as we know, as Bible scholars and many hundreds and thousands of people have studied into this, they can tell you that the first known Gospels that were written, published, and began being distributed was the book of James and the Gospel of John. Now, now, the epistles of John, they, they don't show up till later. But in all of it, there's no author. They, they are 100% anonymous. And even though we give them names, that some guy named John wrote this, or, or some guy named Luke wrote it, we don't know, but somebody wrote it, and we give that person a, a name. Paul hears the words, and then he begins persecuting and we see that today that that's the thing who was the first king of Israel and that was Saul Saul God said I'll choose Saul to be the first king of Israel right but that was a man chosen by men not not by God God said I will give you a king but but one that is likened to each one of your own heart. And Saul, in the Old Testament, the first king of Israel, he's head and shoulder taller than everybody. And everybody in the nation, he's a big guy. He's a big, strong, tough guy. He'll be king. And then while he was king, most of the time, he spent his time pursuing David, the second king of Israel, whom God had anointed as a child to be the second king. And Saul knew it, but he despised that. You know, he, he wanted his own children to be the kings of, of Israel and from the tribes of Benjamin. Yet, you know, that tribe of Judah... That, 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 that their boy who's born in Bethlehem, we, we don't want no part of that. Now why Jesus Nazarite? Be, be, right, Nazareth. And because he was going to be a Nazarite. Yet people, when they read the scriptures and stuff, they couldn't understand it, didn't recognize it. Same with Paul. Or Saul. Reads all the scriptures every day. Not only does he read the scriptures, he preaches the scriptures. But but he couldn't understand it, he, and he didn't understand it. And then all of a sudden, these Jesus people come into his life, and, and he's all upset. How about us today with our Christian walk? As we're there on the internet, and, and we're messing with people, and we're throwing around, and and we're we're being the, the Jedi warriors, right? We love Star Wars. I love Star Wars. I've I've seen all the Star Wars. And big fan, love it. Uh, Jedi. So we got our Jedi warriors out here in the spiritual warfare there online. Right? We, we see it and we do it every day. But are we persecuting other people's faith? You know, we, we persecute people's actions. Like you could persecute my bad behavior, but don't persecute my salvation. Don't persecute my faith. Don't persecute what I know to be a reality and, and to be true. And yet we do that all the time. We'll be a Baptist and we go and we persecute the Presbyterians. We could be a Presbyterian and we go out and we per persecute, you know, the Methodists or whoever it is because <clears throat> we're fighting and arguing over doctrine, words. Same like Paul. No, no. God's name is Jehovah. Right? And that's, I believe, a false name, but it doesn't matter. God's name is Jehovah. No, God's name is, is Yahweh. You can't be saved unless you call on the name of Yahweh. You cannot be saved unless you call, call on the name of, of Jehovah. You cannot be saved unless you call on the name of Allah. Right? All these things, and they all claim. To know the God of the Old Testament. You know that God that talked to Moses face to face? That's the God we all know. That God who promised Abraham way back in the beginning. That's the God we know. This Jesus fellow we don't know. 
We don't know him. Right? And, and Paul, at the stoning of Stephen, now, now whether he was there or not, perhaps maybe he was. Maybe he was up in Tarsus and doing his thing in Turkey. He hears the word. He hears everything of what's going on. So, so eventually, you know, as the Pharisees, as they say, they give Paul a written authority by men. Hey, Paul, you, you can do whatever you need to do to squash out this Jesus rebellion, right? We got in Star Wars, the rebels and, and the empire, right? We got the dark and we got the light, we have the love, and we got the hate. We got the want for power and control, and we got the desire for submissiveness, love, you know. One of the greatest quotes I've ever seen is, uh, is all of it about the destruction of our enemy? Or the preservation of our own lives. What is this about life? And then, you know, are we persecuting people to the point we feel the need to slander them and gossip about them and spread all kinds of rumors and bad things so that other people will not like them? Paul goes like a police officer, like an army soldier, and he's like a, a soldier of God, right? He's in there and he's ripping people out of their houses, out of their homes, dragging them into the street and mocking them and making fun of them, persecuting them. How many of us, like today, we were typing on there and people who use beautiful, nice, kind words, hey, how you doing? Great. How's your life? Blessed, loving it, love life, blessed, you know, and oh, Sally, you're so awesome, and, and there we are kissing each other and kissing butt and, and building each other up, yet if one person, and we say that guy's good, it's good, right, another person writes in and he's typing in, he uses the F-bomb, right? Maybe he doesn't quite attack you by calling you a, a, an F-bombing piece of dung or something, but it just types in and uses some sort of a, a foul language. And then all of a sudden, that guy is bad guy. That guy's the bad guy. And, and what is it we're judging as we're watching and we're looking at the words on, on our screen? Sight. Exactly what we see. We don't even know the person behind there. Maybe somebody uses a bad word, but really they're a good guy. Maybe we're, we're using good words, and really we're a bad guy. You know, what are we doing with our words? Are we using our words as a weapon? Paul's dragging them out and beating them down because they don't believe in his God. And his God is the God of the Bible. This is real. Same like we do today. You're not the people of uh, the Quran. We we're fighting over the Quran. We're fighting over the Old Testament, the Jews. And we're fighting over the entire Holy Bible, which is the Christian Bible. Right? Who's right? How do we be saved? Right? Paul's beating people up. Let me tell you a story. Because we, we had a death yesterday morning here in our home. Real life, true story. Young man named Nick. Right? Nick's 18 years old. Nick looks like he's almost 30. <laughs> he's got a full beard. He's red hair. And he's a little bit shorter than me. I'm about 5'6". He's a little shorter than me. And he weighed 250 more. Big, big, big guy. And he had some health issues and some problems. And and he was friends with the boys here at the house. We, we got a house full of boys here. You know, you're not my only disciples. I have real disciples here in my real realm or reality. And those boys found a young man at school. This man, this Nick was so smart, 
He graduated from high school at 15 years old. And here in America, we, we, most boys, most girls, most children are graduating at, at 18. So he graduates three years early because he's like a little mini genius. Yet he's fat, he's overweight, he, he's kind of got a lot of problems getting around and maybe diabetes, I don't know. Maybe he died of a heart attack, I don't know. 18 years old, and they find him in the bathroom dead. Yesterday morning. And this is the thing that, that bothers me. I wasn't, I know for a fact, that I, I know for a fact that I know this. I don't know if he believed in Jesus Christ, and, and I don't know, and I'm sure he didn't. He grew up in a family where he didn't have a mom and dad. His older brother, who is less than 30 years old, is taking care of his younger brother. And he wasn't taking care of him very well. 16, 18, got a full beard, doesn't take care of himself, isn't eating well. And, and you know what? If it, it, it was outside of these boys here, he would have no friends. And they met him in school, in high school, and they friended him because nobody would be his friend. Everybody rejected him because he was fat and ugly. He's fat and ugly. And in that, he probably looked at himself in the mirror because he didn't see Barbie and he didn't see Ken looking back in his reflection. He probably said, you know, I'm fat and ugly. Who who would want to be my friend? Who wants to like me? Who who out there would want to love me? There, there's nothing hurts a man more, a man more, than, than to believe there's not a woman on earth that would love him. Whether it be your mama, your wife, a girlfriend, a friend, whatever. For a man, I, I'm telling you this is the truth. I'm a man. I, I, I know what these feelings are. When you don't have that wife, when, when you don't have that loved one, you don't have that bestie. The guy was uh, uh, quiet as a mouse. He, he was a little tiny mouse inside this giant body. And when you talk to him, you know, you, you would think that, hey boy, how's it going? Right, that would be what come out. And, and no, it was more like, Hi, how are you today, sir? But this giant guy and this little tiny mouse squeaked out and very, very fragile guy. And today, he doesn't have to carry that burden anymore. And it's tough when, when you kids and these people come into your life and you wonder, did I have an impact on their life? And was that impact good? But, but I know that there's only one thing that I praise in all of it is glory be to God, Jesus lives. He is alive. He is alive. I can ask him whether his mom and dad, his brother, or anybody. That this is why that boy was in our life. So I could pray for his salvation. And, and, and God puts that in my heart. He, he prayed for this boy. Pray for his forgiveness. The world rejected him, and maybe he even rejected himself, but, but the good news is, God has not rejected him. That's the good news. God doesn't reject him. The, the blessed assurance is when we're being rejected by the world, the good news is God will not reject us. It says pray for him. I pray for him. Pray God would forgive him. And, and would release him from the bondages of, of that weight he was carrying. That weight of feeling worthless. 
You know, that, that's the thing with Paul, with Saul, as he's beating these people down. How can I forgive you when I can't forgive myself? And, and, and we're going by sight, what we see. Not be what, what, what we believe. Because this is what the people were telling Saul. And I want to read you something. Uh, from out of the book of, uh, of Psalms. What were they telling Saul? They, they were saying to Saul, Saul, we believe in the same God you believe. In fact, Saul, you know that guy that you say you so love and trust there in, in, in the Psalms, chapter 27? That guy, we, we met him. And, and, and we're saying that this is how believable the Bible is. We met him. That's what I tell people all the time. Even in our world today, this is how believable the Word of God is that, that you can read Isaiah 55 and, and believe today is that day. And you are my witness. That's how believable God's Word is. Right now in, in your life. It's here. It's now. It's not tomorrow. It's not yesterday. It, it, we don't need to wait anymore. Right now is the hour. Right now is the time. People begin to cry out because of the great persecution that was happening on them. And that's the part people forget that we, we, the believers, have a great power behind us. And that power is within our prayer. What could I do? I, I can't do nothing for no one. But, but I can trust in, in a God whom can. That that was what they were telling Saul, Saul, that that man, that, that thing you call God, we call Father. We know him as Dad. That guy that, that, that they were talking about in, in Psalm 27, we met that guy. And Saul, Paul couldn't believe it. Gets permission, he's heading out to Damascus. Syria. Goes from Turkey to Syria. Right? Where, where, where do we see today in Turkey and Syria? 100%, 99.99.9% yeah, Muslim. That, that was where Paul was doing his preaching. And he was doing just like them. Living by sight and not by faith. Oh, you're not praying to our God until we see you on your knees. And not just on your knees, but at the exact same time, I'm on my knees. And we're all going to bow down wherever we are on the earth to one statue, to one place. That place in Mecca. All at the same time. That. God knows you're praying to Him. Well, it's not about God. That way I know you're praying to Him. So Saul, the first king of Israel, where, where's Israel? Who's Israel? This nation? No, Israel. This Israel. This is nation. This is kingdom. So as believers, we come and we, we right away, you know, we start to see all the problems in the world and what's going on and, and, and everything. And, and we believe we can fix the problems. And the problem with the world is you're in it, right? And if we just fixed you and got rid of you, then things would go better. Saul in the Old Testament, first king, persecuted David. Chasing David all around the nation, persecuting him. What if that persecution's inside of ourselves? And it's a reflection of how we feel about ourselves is, is exactly how and what we're doing to other people. And yet maybe we don't even realize it. 
and he's got this, he's heading to Damascus to go cause trouble, beat people down, to persecute them, to rip them from their homes, because they're not believing in his God. Right? And then Jesus appears to him. Saul, he says, and he shines out in a bright light that, that, no, that he couldn't be denied. Saul, yes, Lord, who are you? Saul ends up being blinded for three days. He had something like scales come over his eyes. Saul, yes, Lord, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Who are you? I've never seen you. How, do I, how am I persecuting you? What, what's going on? Right? He, what's going on? He, he's having an encounter with the risen Christ, with God himself. And, and he's like, what's going on? He says, I am Jesus of Nazareth, the one you are persecuting. Now, now, why did he say Jesus of Nazareth? Because the only thing Paul probably knew of Jesus was there was a man crucified in Jerusalem, and on that cross it said, King of the Jews. This is the King of the Jews. This is Jesus of Nazareth. And in that day, it was Jesus. It was Jesus. This is Jesus of, of Nazareth. You're persecuting me. Who, who are you, Lord? The one you're persecuting. In the world. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter where you are. Doesn't matter what your name is. Who are you persecuting me, says the Lord. Right? Jesus says to his disciples, whatever you do to the least, you've done it to me. The least, you've done it to me. The least in the kingdom of God, you've done it to me. Remember Saul and he's, he's, he's David and he's got Abner there and he's got his general there, the general of his army and Saul and all of Israel's there and they're seeking to get David and David's got his people there and they sneak into the in the camp. God created a, a deep sleep to come over to Saul and, and all the soldiers in the camp. And David and, and his general are there and they go into the camp and they take Saul's staff. And the general says to David, he's sound asleep. I, I could staple his head right now to the ground with my spear. And all of this will be over. David says, God forbid. That's Saul. That is the anointed king of Israel. God forbid. Anointed by God. Let him be. Right. Next morning, there's David on the top of the hill. Looking down at Saul, looking down at the company, and he says not to Saul, but to Abner, Saul's main protection, Saul's general, he says to Abner, look what I have. I could have taken his life, and you were there in charge to protect over him, and yet I could have taken his life this night but I wanted you to know that I am holy that I too am anointed by God so I spared your life not just once but two times two times and yet you seek to persecute me you seek to destroy me and, and I had the power in my hand to destroy you 
but I, I gave you life. And Saul said, now I know you are anointed by God. You, you are of God. And, and, and God is going to give you the kingdom because you have a righteous and pure heart. You have spared my life, even though I spent my life seeking to persecute you, hurt you, and, and, and destroy you. You are the one God chose because you have a heart for God. Right. Jesus, back to Saul in the New Testament. I'm the one who has your life in my hand. And the encounter of meeting Jesus, God, face to face, transformed Paul right on the spot. As he was a great persecutor and then becomes kind of like a savior, kind of like Jesus. I'm going to believe that the God who spoke, the Holy Spirit that spoke of Psalm 27, I'm going to believe that guy. Because not only... Did, did those others meet him in his suffering? I met him in his glory. Right? And that's why Paul in Timothy chapter 6, you know, that the God is not about personal gain. And, and those who seek personal gain through God, whether it's through prayer, whatever, that that's ungodly. He says, yet this is what you do. That's why I tell you not to do it, to avoid it. Because if you take, participate in it, you're going to become frustrated and, and upset. You're going to find that there's nothing in, in, on earth that can fill the hole that's in your heart. Except for Jesus. Except for Jesus. I don't have to live by the opinions of others or their praise. Don't listen to the praise of men, but to the praise of, of God. It's like Paul, a chief sinner. Look at, look at how God is using a chief sinner to preach the gospel of grace, the gospel of love. Look at how God transformed me from an abusive person into somebody that, that was usable usable for good. Paul goes in and the first thing he does is starts preaching about the good news of Jesus Christ. He's risen. And that everything in the Bible can be believed by faith. We, we don't have to walk by sight to it. We can believe it. Paul is unjustly beaten down in his first ministry, his first sermon. <laughs> and then the persecution turns to him, and he's beaten down. And they're going to haul him off to jail. And Paul says, is, is it just that you're going to kill and hit and beat a, a Roman citizen? I ain't even from here. I'm from Rome. And he's saying, are, are you guys lawless? You say you believe in a law, yet are you obeying that law? See, even in Rome, they had laws. Can't beat a, a Roman citizen without witnesses of him doing something wrong. He's preaching about a new God, a, a God no one had ever heard of. A God who, whose very essence was unconditional love. Something they didn't know. A God who, whose essence is unconditional love. And not only is his essence an unconditional love, he can manifest and appear right into the midst of your life. So he's sitting there in prison and they're praying and praising God. 
And all of a sudden, a great earthquake comes and breaks open the, the gates and the doors of the prison, and everybody could escape. And, and the guy who was in charge of the prison, jailhouse guard, he's down in his home. It's probably like a cave or something in his backyard. We don't know. Locked him up in, in the garage in the back. And he comes running out and he sees that the door is wide open, the gates are open. And of course, in his own mind, he probably is thinking, boy, I just beat these guys down earlier this day, and they, they ran off. They, they ran away. Paul had every right to run away. Nothing he did was, was breaking the law. It was bad. I just want to tell you the good news. That you can have a relationship with the living God today. And then they beat him down for it. They break him down for it. Yeah, when, when it was his turn for revenge, right? The, the jailer is about to kill himself. It'd be better to, to rather than get caught breaking the your, your responsibilities there in Rome, be crucified. You'd be hurt. I don't want to be tortured. I don't want to be crucified. I'll just kill myself right now. Whips out a sword and he's about to lay himself on it. He's got a house filled with family. Mothers and his daughters and his children. And Paul comes running out of the prison. He stayed there. Didn't run away. And he comes out and says, Whoa, 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 stop, stop, stop. Don't don't hurt yourself. There's no need to hurt yourself. We are all right here. We haven't gone anywhere. Please don't hurt yourself. I want to leave. That guy's life all of a sudden was more important than Paul's life. And later the, the jailer takes Paul and Barnabas and that and they're in, the, in his own home. And, and they begin to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the guard who unjustly beat him down and the whole family was saved. That's the power of God's Holy Spirit when, when he says, I'm going to put my spirit on you. That's the power of it. That's the power of God. It's not personal gain. It's not anything to do with that. And we don't need to fight and bicker over the scriptures. That's not God either. God is love. It's very loving, tender, kind. Even in the midst of persecution, He is very tender, loving, and kind. That, 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 that's the thing. Second king of Israel. Israel, nation, my body. One body, the body of Christ. One mind, the mind of Christ. One spirit, the spirit of Christ. The same spirit that rose Jesus back to life. The same spirit that appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. That spirit dwells in us. When are we going to surrender to the will of that spirit? As it is that spirit that desires for us to, to walk in love while the whole world sets in hate. Walk in love. Follow me, says the Lord, to each and every one of them who are sitting in a place of judgment, of hate, and hypocrisy. We all have sin. We're all imperfect. We, we all have problems. But let us deal with each other in our problems humbly. Understanding it and knowing that we're all under the same pressures in this world. We all have the same feelings in this world. We all want to be accepted. We all want to be cherished. We all want somebody to desire us. Not that we want to desire them. We want them to desire us.
And so God isn't about selfishness. Sorry, we don't need to take oath with God. Oh God, I, I promise God is in us, with us, and he already knows exactly what is honest, what is true, what you're going to do and what you're not. Because he's in us and with us. See, see, that was what Paul was explaining to them about the good news, how God could use the chief of sinners, the man of perdition, to do something good. And he even says Jesus is the one who holds back the Antichrist, holds back the devil in the fullness of it. And why does he hold him back? Because God's desire is for you. And so long as we're on the earth, God has a desire for you. We're far from God. Yet we're not far at all from God. God is in us and with us. Greater is he who lives in me than he who lives in the world. So we don't want to submit ourselves to the desires of the flesh, the desires of the flesh. Say, I, I need you to appreciate me. I need you to validate me. The desires of, of the flesh are always seeking to fulfill anything that, that the flesh needs. Sin. Desiring anything other than the living God. And the love of money? Desire of money? That that's not peace, that that's not the gift of God. So in all those preachers and teachers who are preaching that, that, that God rewards in earthly things, they're deceiving you. Because that's not the peace of God, riches, glory, honor, and fame. That, that's not the riches of God. That's not a gift from the Holy Spirit. The gift from the Holy Spirit is being content in what you have, in, in where you are, being content in, in God's control, not my control. See, see, prayer and, and Jesus with Jesus, Jesus can go to the places we cannot. We have limits. We have flesh, and the flesh limits us. But we can see through internet, we can see through television, that God has no limits. And the reward for being honest, the reward for being honest, the reward for saying I'm depressed, the reward for saying I can't forgive myself, the reward for saying I wish I could be better, but I don't know how. Is Jesus Christ in your life? It's Jesus, and he's there now. He's there even today. It says, The Lord is the light of my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Right? And they tell Paul, this is who we know. We know Jesus of Nazareth, and we know him personally. Who is the Lord? Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Jesus is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? Even evildoers assail to eat my flesh, my adversaries and foes. It is they who stumble and fall. Those who are persecuting, walking in slanderous behaviors, fall. I've seen people believe that me and Kato Tenji are, are one person. That's how confused they are. Yet they claim to know God. Yet God is still punishing them through the power of confusion. The power of not being able to rest. They're still persecuting Jesus even to this day. Though an army encamp against me, my heart sh 
shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing that I ask of the Lord, Jesus, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of Jesus, the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in the shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me up high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Is any of this kind of Psalm 27, is any of this sounding familiar? As Paul says, this is what I finally come to believe. That when Christ was crucified, so was I. Crucified with Christ on the cross. For now I no longer live. It is now Christ who lives in me. I mean, that guy was persecuting Paul. And Paul could have been all mad and jaded and watched him kill himself. But Paul says, let me cover you, my enemy, and show you kindness, love, and mercy. Jesus says, love your enemies. Paul, great example of him loving his enemy and the, the response from loving his enemy was a house full of joy as the Holy Spirit went in and, and, and saved the whole house. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. You have, yes, said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, O Lord, I do seek. Are we seeking the face of God? Hide your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O oh, you who have been helped, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O oh, my God of salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me. But the Lord will take me in. Wow, what a comforting sentence. Especially knowing that a young man died yesterday morning, that that was a part of our family, and we didn't sure if he was saved or not. But boy, we, we, we see right here, he is saved. Because it doesn't say, Oh, thank God, my words saved me. Thank God my righteousness saved me. Thank God my good deeds saved me. No, it says my Lord saved me. Jesus Christ. It says my God saved me. It was his doing. It was his will. It was his love. It was his grace. It was his desire. And he did it. That we have to be thankful for. Because he did it. Teach me your way, O oh Lord. And lead me on a level path because of my enemy. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries. For false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I breathe out violence. 
I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I will look at it. The goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. The good news. The dead have risen in Jesus Christ. The good news. God is not a man hanging on a cross. The good news. It's the dead rise first. And then the living. And then the living. We'll meet them in the air. We'll meet them in, in, in the spirit. And God will be first one in line to say, My dead son is now alive. Come. He says to everybody in heaven, Rise! Rise up, children! My son was dead and now is alive. Rise up. Let's party. Let's rejoice. Let's celebrate. Because in all of heaven, as we proclaim here on earth the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, they proclaim, unto us a Savior has been born. Glory be to God. We live. See you next time, guys. <laughs>